Hey, I'm Spinny Chad, and I'm trying to beat Kerbal Space Program 1 using aircraft only. And today, we're going to push it to the limit and try to reach Mach 12 while flying in the atmosphere. Our hardest contract yet, by far. It's going to take everything we've unlocked and everything we've learned along the way to complete this one. But first up, we're going to head over to Mission Control. And first, of course, we see our mission that says Reaching Mach 12, which literally tells us nobody will blame you if you can't do it. Very encouraging words. Here we just have a quick science mission that we'll complete along the way, and then the contract we're using to scam a company for free jet engines. Only 400 days left on that. And then we have our first contract today, which is to simply fly by the mun. This contract and the science we get along the way is going to help us unlock some more parts that we'll need to actually complete our Mark 12 contract that we've got later on. So we're going to upgrade our SSD over in the last video, the SO3S Starling, and then we're going to uh, add some extra liquid fuel, spread the uh, landing uh, gear out a little bit, and also notice that we have the wings way too far back and try to push those up a little bit. Um, but it turns out that maybe the wings were that far back for a reason. As you will see shortly, I accidentally made this SSDO super maneuverable. <laughs> Yes, you're seeing that correctly. I just pulled a Cobra in an SSTO, it, though it doesn't really end that well. Uh, super maneuverable SSTO is surely a sight to behold. You know, usually these are very big and heavy crafts that aren't doing things like this, but those Panther engines on the back uh, actually allow us to do post-style maneuvers and all that fancy stuff because they have some really great thrust vectoring that we haven't adjusted or touched at all, so it's it's wide open. We also have a swivel engine there, uh, so we have even more thrust vectoring. So it's pretty much perfect for doing crazy crap like this. And I'm going to try to prove, once and for all, that pretty much anything with a 1TWR, no matter what it is, is a VTOL if you're creative enough. So we're going to do this weird inverted knife edge thing, um, and then fly upside down back over to a more flat spot and try to properly land it using jet engine power alone because that would probably be the best clip to come out of this series so far, landing a fully loaded SSTO on its butt. That would be pretty darn cool. So we're going to try to land here next to the launch pad, and as we slow down, we're immediately running into some problems with it, uh, kind of oscillating around, and yeah, we're probably not going to be landing this thing anytime soon. And we don't really need a super maneuverable SSTO anyway, because, uh, well, unless the KSC gets invaded, there's really no reason to be pulling Cobras with this thing. So we're going to move those wings back and reduce Jeb's access to stimulants to fix it. And after that, we go back over to the runway, and hopefully this time we go in a semi-straight line and not directly straight up like last time. And I'm sure Jeb's pretty disappointed with the outcome of this because we took off like a normal plane, like a normal SSTO at least. And look at that shot of those afterburners lining. I like to use those in the climb up uh, just to give us some extra speed up to about 200 meters per second and then switch back to regular uh, dry turbofan mode and then switch back to the afterburners once we uh, start losing speed with the turbofans and continue our climb. It's a pretty weird process uh, flying these uh, Panther SSTOs, trying to get the most fuel economy we can and, uh, you know, get to orbit without burning up or anything. And once we start losing speed on the afterburner mode, we, of course, light our swivel engine and begin our rocket stage up to orbit. And uh, eventually, of course, uh, almost immediately, actually, our Panther engines completely die out, and it's just all rocket power to orbit. And you may notice that I've been trying to take these ascents to orbit as shallow as I possibly can, and that's to try to stay efficient. I know me and efficiency don't usually match up, but uh, with something like this, you want to try to stay as efficient as possible because we're barely squeezing a thousand delta V out of this if we're lucky. And it turns out we're pretty lucky. We got over a thousand delta V out of this and both Jeb and I are very happy about this outcome because that is more than enough to get us all the way to a Mun flyby and back home safely. But of course, we have to actually get a Mun flyby. I'm going to be fancy and actually use the maneuver node to do this. Usually you can just point toward the Mun, wait till the Mun rises over top of Kerbin and uh, just burn prograde toward the Mun and you'll get a flyby. Uh, and I wish I would have actually done that because I completely missed our Mun flyby, like completely missed it. And Jeb had to spend a good month in orbit before we were able to get an actual Mun flyby. But once we did get the Mun flyby, it was a pretty distant one, and it turned out to be a fairly lackluster experience if it wasn't for all of the science that we got from it. Once we activated the Science Junior and all of these other ones, I could tell that this mission was going to be pretty darn profitable for us. Here's us flying by the Mun at a very far distance, <laughs> and then we're just going to come back to Kerbin 
and hopefully bring this back down to some runway somewhere safely. But like with most of my space plane missions, this is going to require a quite a bit of air braking. There's always so much air braking to be done with all of these space plane missions and stuff that I'm tempted to just start calling this the air brake challenge because most of my time recording these is just air braking around Kerbin until I get a low Kerbin orbit. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and fast forward many, 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 many passes through the upper atmosphere of Kerbin before we can finally land somewhere. And where we're going to be landing is Night Island, which is that little uh, waypoint right there that we've marked. It's just basically a little runway on an island. We also accidentally melted off our landing camera uh, on the re-entry here, which uh, I haven't got to use yet, and I guess we're not going to use it still. And as you can probably tell, this was turning out to be one of our spiciest re-entries yet, especially with this SSTO. And uh, it's got some pretty big control surfaces that uh, have full authority limiter. So uh, yeah, if I just barely, barely touch the flat stick during this re-entry, it would just flip up and completely lose control and, well, die. So we're going to go ahead and turn those control surfaces down so we don't have a certified Boeing moment every single time we pull up on the stick. And we're going to go ahead and fly out to Nye Island, which this turned out to be a problem in and of itself because we had very little fuel and we were actually like 500 kilometers away from the island, the nearest runway to us. So we had to uh, try to do a very efficient flight out to the island. Um, and uh, me and efficiency, as mentioned before, uh, usually don't go hand in hand. But I did manage to get it out to the island with plenty of fuel to spare. You can see it pop up in the distance here. And that marks the time that we're going to go ahead and try to fly down through the cloud layers and line up with the runway. Which was in a pretty awkward angle for us. So we're going to have to uh, fly down here without losing control again, hopefully. And try to line it up for a nice and gentle landing. Yeah, but as with everything else that we've tried to do in this episode so far, uh, that didn't work out quite as well as we would have thought. <laughs> Yeah, we had probably the worst approach ever, but really not the worst landing ever. It, it was an okay landing, I would say, though it was uh, really, really, really sketchy, as you can see. It was a pretty gentle landing, and I'm sure Jeb couldn't sue us for whiplash or anything after that one. Uh, it, was, it was under 2Gs, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but then we began spinning. And I don't know what it is about this island or where it's located or whatever, but uh, yeah, we were just spinning. The friction didn't do anything to stop us. So fair warning, if you land at Nye Island, you'll apparently just get microwaved. In more ways than one, look at that dish in the background. But Kerbal Conspiracies aside, I had to actually retract the landing gear to get this thing recovered. But once we did, we got 276 sides, by far our biggest sides return yet. But when we go over to spin it, we're left with a choice. Actually own the Panther engines or get all of these wing parts to build our Mach 12 plane. So I ended up going with the wing parts, and we're just going to keep running our scam on the Panther engines as long as possible. So now that we have absolutely everything that we need to make the Mach 12 plane, it's time to get started. This is going to be the first part of the whole Mach 12 system. This is going to be the thing that actually holds Jeb, and it's basically just some fuel tanks with the most efficient engine that we have, and of course the thing to hold Jeb in. Um, and we're going to go ahead and paint it black because, I mean, you're going Mach 12, it seems like... This should be cool and painted black, SR-71 style, but you know, way, way faster. Dark Star style, but even faster than that. <laughs> Here is the carrier plane. This is actually going to lift the smaller plane up into uh, suborbital trajectory, orbital trajectory. It's depending on how much fuel this thing ends up having in the end. And we're going to put some delta wings on there and double them up and kind of box in the engines, which we have a lot of. We've got some thud engines on there that are going to be clustered together, and then four panther engines. And those panther engines are going to be fed by only two intakes. Those are plenty enough to feed those panther engines. And we're going to have these split vertical stabilizers so that we can actually mount the plane on top there. Um, and we will go ahead and paint it, of course, red and black for complete cool factor. And we're going to go ahead and mount our little plane here, which is this little plane is actually going to be controlling the entire thing. There's no probes or cockpits inside of that lower, bigger plane, and Jeb's just gonna be controlling the entire thing from the top little plane up there. But we've got this awesome thing out on the runway, and I'm really hoping that we can try to get Mach 12 on the very first try. We have four Panther engines on the lower stage there, and six thuds clustered in the middle, 
and Jeb is just going to be controlling this whole thing from a very, very cramped tiny little cockpit inside there. I'll show it to you here in a second on the IVA look. We're going to do basically the same ascent we've been doing with every SSTO because the hopes are is that the lower stage will be an SSTO and that the upper stage will basically be an orbiter. So think of it as like a space shuttle but uh, it only holds one guy in this cramped little room that you see here with basically no way of looking out, which I think is probably the smart way of doing this because Mach 12 is probably not that healthy for giant windows. And just like the other SSTOs that we've launched, we go ahead and turn on our afterburners as soon as we start losing speed in the dry mode on those engines. And it's time to start trying to build speed up to around 850 meters per second, which seems to be about the limit for uh, Panther engines with these intakes and stuff. And just like with the dry mode on the Panther engines, as soon as we start losing losing speed with the afterburner mode, we're going to go ahead and activate the next mode, which will be the thud engines in the middle. And although they're really, really powerful and push our thrust to weight ratio up to almost two, doesn't really look like it because the waterfall, uh, the waterfall plume for uh, these, that's the mod that makes the plumes look really, really pretty. Uh, it's it's kind of lackluster. It doesn't really have uh, some nice mock diamonds or anything. They just kind of puff out and they don't really look that powerful but they are very powerful and we have nearly two thrust to weight ratio uh, just right off the bat with this like 1.8 or something like that so uh, this thing is going to be picking up speed really really fast though those aren't the most efficient engines ever uh, I chose to go with something with a high thrust to weight ratio so that we could get this to orbit fairly easy and uh, one of the downsides of this design is that once the lower stage the carrier aircraft runs out of fuel it becomes really really light uh, but the top aircraft is still full of fuel, so the whole thing starts tipping out of control whenever you uh, activate the engines or throttle them up at all. So to fix this, I took the top aircraft's uh, Terrier engine and put it on an independent throttle, which is just that little, uh, that little slide bar there, and then played with the main throttle and the independent throttle until we got a good balance between them, and I could squeeze just the last little bit of Delta V out of the Carrier aircraft before we had to... Uh, detach from it and the detachment process is pretty darn cool in and of itself you just basically flip down and it goes flying away and now that carrier aircraft is completely uncontrollable there's nothing in that to control it and it's just going to fall down and basically be a booster and an expendable booster the first thing we've expended i'm pretty sure so far in the series um and we're in low carbon orbit with 3200 delta v in the upper aircraft here the the actual mach 12 plane we're going to go ahead to our periapsis here, which is at around 75 uh, kilometers, and we're going to go ahead and push our apoapsis out as far as we possibly can, which is going to be the plan for the Mach 12 mission. We're going to push the apoapsis out to the very edge of Kerbin's sphere of influence, basically as far as we can get away from Kerbin while still be being in orbit around Kerbin. And then we're going to try to come back down, and that's going to be our Mach 12 run, because... Mach 12 around Kerbin is escape velocity, well over escape velocity, and the maximum speed you can get while still being in orbit around Kerbin is going to be a bit over 3,000 meters per second. We need to get to 4,116, I think it is, meters per second. So we're going to come back down here, and this is the actual Mach 12 run. And it just so happens that at this very important moment where you probably want to see everything going on about your craft, yeah, there's an eclipse happening. The moon just so happens to be passing in front of the sun, and the shadow is exactly where we're going to be passing through Kerbin's atmosphere. At around 61 kilometers, by the way, that's going to be our periapsis, so not super deep into the atmosphere, but I'm not going to push it any farther than that. And well, before we even get into the atmosphere, I'm going to go ahead and start accelerating this thing, because we're going to need to burn this engine for a very long time to even get up to the 4100 meters per second. So we're going to be burning as we come into the atmosphere and while we're in it. Here's Jeff's point of view inside of his crypt, a uh, tiny little uh, cockpit there with one tiny little window as he goes full throttle ahead into Kerbin's atmosphere at 3,800 meters per second. We're going to go ahead and pull up the vertical speed view here in a second so you can see the vertical speed because it's a very important part of this mission. We need to make sure our vertical speed is under 150 meter meters per second before we can actually complete the contract. Uh, so we're already very close to Mach 12 here, and we're getting overheat lines already on our parts. We're very close to that uh, 150 meters per second vertical speed, so I'm going to keep just touching the throttle a little bit and getting it closer and closer to Mach 12. Once we get under the 150, I'm going to go ahead and slam the throttle for that last around 100 meters per second of speed that we need. And you can see we already have plasma around us in the 
uh, uh, upper stratosphere here. So you can tell that we're going really, really fast. We actually push it well past Mach 12, and at this altitude, we're actually nearly going Mach 14, but we're only measuring by the at sea level Mach 12. And here's an epic Mach 12 flyby as we right at the point as we leave the atmosphere of Kerbin for good. We only stayed around in the atmosphere for maybe 30 seconds. It was a very quick pass. But with that, we've officially gone Mach 12 while flying in the atmosphere in a straight line. But now Jeb has a completely different problem. We only have around a thousand meters per second of Delta V and he needs to slow himself down fast because this craft has almost been pushed out to the orbit of moho with that amount of speed and we're just trying to get back home not go on an interplanetary mission so i've got to try to burn as much delta v as i can as fast as possible because the farther we get away from kerbin the more inefficient this burn becomes and we're down to around 200 meters per second and jeb's still not in orbit but just barely with 100 meters per second to spare jeb makes it back into Kerbin orbit. So he's captured and well somewhat safe because there is yet another problem now. He's gonna bring that apoapsis all the way back down to a lowish Kerbin orbit and you know actually bring this in for a landing somewhere. And given we have like 50 meters per second of Delta V after this quick little boost here to bring our apoapsis down just a little bit, you know what it's time for. It's your boy air braking yeah and lots and lots of air braking more air braking than the last ssto and uh, jeb did some beyblade stuff there i don't know what that was about uh but yeah we got to bring this down and we've also got to manage electricity because we only have like i think 50 uh electric uh, units to uh, play around with electric charge to play around with uh, so, and that's our only control while we're in the upper atmosphere in space but i went ahead and skipped all of those many 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 air brake passes and i'm gonna go ahead and show you the final air brake pass here i wasn't able to bring it down anywhere really near a runway but we managed to kind of get toward uh this lower like little runway somewhere uh, in the south of this area right here but yeah i just couldn't make it all the way out to there because we have no jet engines on board um and so i'm gonna have to try to land it on this bank here to at least land it somewhere so it's unfortunately our first landing that isn't actually at a proper airport but after what jeb's been through i'm sure he's just going to be happy to be touching the ground again this is one of those missions that's going to have him out kissing the ground on Kerbin. but here we are and there is a plane that has just went mach 12 I had no idea when we were filming the Mach 9 one that we would even be able to go this fast. And I'm just hoping that there's nothing past the Mach 12 mission. Uh, we go ahead and claim our reward for it. And they mentioned that they canceled the funeral procession that they prepared for uh, Jeb, I guess. And if I'm being honest, I kind of expected him to at least get lost in space. So I don't really blame him for that. I headed over to Mission Control and very fearfully scrolled down to where all the other Mach missions had been. And there was nothing else there, thankfully. So I guess it means that next up we're going to have to do a proper visit to the Mun. And maybe land there, maybe not, in the next episode though. Because that is all I've got for today. Thank you so much for for watching i work really hard on getting these videos out for you guys and i'm so glad that you love watching them as much as i love making them but that's all i've got for today this is smoonie chad out <laughs>